our uh, video editing. It's done. Uh, that gives segue into something I want to introduce that we're going to be starting next Sunday. And uh, many churches follow what's called a lectionary, a cycle of readings. And they tend to be mainline churches or older churches. Um, and some evangelicals, some Pentecostals are, are bringing it back. There's a a lectionary that's been formed called the Narrative Lectionary that begins next Sunday, and it will be an insert that you will have in your newsletter every week. And it has a reading for each day of the week, a devotional pattern that you can use. I would encourage you to use it at home, use it in your personal life, use it at your dinner table. Uh, and there is a uh, in your bulletin today or your newsletter today, there is a description of what you're going to get next week, and then every Sunday we're going to try this as a trial. And the idea is to encourage devotional reading, encourage you to read through Scripture and get the big scope from the beginning all the way through uh, the Bible. And then we will be sharing some of that Scripture each Sunday as well in worship. It may just stand alone. I may not preach on that text at all. It may just stand alone, and that's okay. Some of us were driven in the super thematic church where everything had to tie together. I'm more uh, decentered Anabaptist, so I'm okay with things just standing alone and letting God speak through that, uh, regardless of whether the songs, the teaching, the prayers all exactly fit the same way. So we're going to introduce that narrative lectionary for nine months, and it actually can be cycled, and there's a four-year cycle, but we're going to start with uh, the first nine months, and uh, we'll be engaging that. And then you also have a devotional resource to use in your daily life as well, and so we want to encourage that. So yeah, the narrative lectionary, that's what that's all about. We encourage you to dig into that and it will provide you also, if you're not used to doing reading scripture, it'll give you an easy guide to read for each day. And again, if you read the insert here, it also talks about grace. If you miss a day or whatever, how that works as well. Um, but I want to encourage our church to get deeper into the scriptures, which is one of the challenges of Christian formation is that you actually learn the big story of stories and story of God that's revealed in scripture. Uh, so I want to encourage you to get on board with that and be open to that as we dig into the narrative lectionary. Today, however, we're starting a new series. In fact, we're starting two series that we're going to rotate over the next about two months. Uh, the series is called Triggered. And this idea of how we respond to things that get us emotionally sort of, uh, uh, emotionally sort of stirred up. And the other series we'll be rotating in will be First Peter, back to some verse-by-verse -verse stuff in Scripture. Uh, and so I believe that we're all, you're, you're intelligent and you're wise enough to be able to track with two things at once. Uh, our phones are inundating us with, you know, hundreds of things at once. So I want to focus on those things as we move into the fall season. So today we're going to start with this idea of, of being triggered. And by the way, my name's Shelby, or Shell. I'm the pastor here at Pilgrim Church, and welcome. If you're here for the first time, we're glad you're here. Some research came out uh, a little bit ago in 2015 about this idea of the quiet eye. So researchers have found that uh, there are some common mental processes or processes that mark out elite athletes. And one of these appears to be something called the quiet eye. It's a kind of enhanced visual perception that allows this athlete to eliminate distractions as they plan their next move. So this quiet eye appears to be particularly important at times of stress. It prevents athletes from choking at moments of high pressure. It can even lead to, for some to be in this, what is referred to sometimes as the flow state, where things just sort of, you're in this zone where things just uh, click for you as an athlete or a creative as well. This laser sharp focus, uh, the research goes on and says, can help doctors maintain their focus even as they perform surgery, entering into this quiet eye and this flow state. And it's of increasing interest as well to groups like the military, imagine that. Kinesiologist Dr. Joan Vickers began to suspect that the secret of extraordinary performance lay in the way elite athletes see the world. And so she hooked, uh, looked up a group of a professional golfers to a device, hooked them up to a device that precisely monitored their eye movements as they putted. And she found an intriguing correlation. The better the player, the longer and steadier their gaze on the ball just before and during their strike. Novices, by contrast, tended to shift their focus between different areas of the scene for shorter periods of time. Makes me want to talk about our devices and distraction losing the ability of flow state and this quiet eye, but that's not my sermon today. But you get the general idea is this, that you should keep your eye on the ball is well known, of course, but this suggests something more intricate going on. 
with precise duration of a gaze correlating with an objective measure of sporting success. Hang with me. I'm going to bring this all around here in just a moment. But researchers do caution that we should be wary of assigning too much importance to the quiet eye. There are many other factors, of course. But this would certainly seem to be one of the key factors, this extreme focus of athletes. When we are being formed in the image of Christ, part of our challenge is to learn to uh, respond to our emotional states differently. Brain science has told us that the amygdala aspect of our brain, which probably helped us well thousands of years, or depending on your belief, tens of thousands of years ago, uh, your amygdala inter interacts when you are emotionally something causes a trigger, causes something to, to rise up, something to change in you, and you kick into your animal sort of your brain that, that goes into fight or flight. And the problem with this is it may have served you well running uh, in the jungles uh, back in the day, and it may serve us well occasionally when we see uh, you know, defensive driving and that sort of thing. But when it comes to our emotions and how we engage with each other, it actually can be really destructive going into fight or flight when we are emotionally uh, upset by something or the, as the word trigger speaks of. It's common these days, though, that we do talk more frequently about this idea of being triggered. That word is used a lot. In fact, there was a comedian that went on, uh, I think it was, I forget, it was MTV Music Awards, and he was of an older generation, uh, and he mocked this whole idea about younger people uh, being worried about being triggered and, and, and uh, cowering and this and that, and he completely, completely just missed his audience. They did not receive his humor well. He mocked this idea of being triggered by something and talking about it and then finding a safe space. Uh, on the other hand, you have another generation that demands safe spaces and goes to the other extreme and yet seems to not necessarily do the work that that space is supposed to create. And so we want to talk about this a little bit in these Sundays of the church should be a safe place, but not a safe place that we simply uh, uh, retreat back into ourselves, but we begin to address what's going on in our heart, in our mind, in our soul, and how does Jesus interact with that? And so we want to spend some time talking about this idea of being triggered. Two main scriptures this morning, and I'm introducing the topic today a little bit. Are, are you still with me? Can you say yes or amen or something so I know you're with me on this holiday? Oh, okay, all right. I've got 20 of you with me, or 20% maybe. Uh, I think this is important to understand that these emotionally upsetness are, are warning lights in our lives. They're telling us something. And that something is important to discern, and that's where we kick in with our faith, and we need to ask questions about how do we discern that something. What do we do when we have these patterns of reaction, whether it's through pain or trauma? We'll talk about that in just a second of more formal definition and informal use of the word trigger. Um, but whether it's pain or whether it's pleasure or patterns of reaction, is what do we do to move beyond uh, simply sort of saying, okay, that's what I am and that's who I am and just leave it at that, or, uh, sort of as, as we would say more common in our older generations, just stuff our emotions down and pretend that it doesn't happen there and we lose something of our humanity there as well. Where do we, where do we go with this? You say, well, does Scripture speak about this? Uh, not with obviously that kind of language, but I would put before you this morning that yes. In fact, two verses come to mind. One is Romans 12, verse 2. And we'll be unpacking more of these Scriptures in the rest of the series. But... This is an important one to hang on to today. And he says this, Paul is writing and he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. And when Paul uses the word world, he's talking about powers and forces and even brokenness of the power of sin within us versus those things which are life-giving, cause us to flourish, come alive, and make decisions that help others also come alive in the grace of God and Jesus Christ. So when he says, do not conform to the pattern of the world, is this whole constellation of things that are destructive ultimately. Promise life, but are lying to us. Do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's something about going on autopilot, conformity to how we are. The Christianity says that within us we are blessed and we are broken and we live into those truths. And in fact, we are richer and deeper when we wrestle with those things in the grace of Jesus. Jesus. 
versus simply assuming all that is, is as it should be within us and in the world around us. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I would submit to you that Paul's use of mind is much more than our current sort of modern use where we reduce it down to simple uh, biology and the matter between our ears. But this totality of of who we are uh, and, and ties that in as well. So this renewing of our mind, our thought processes, our feelings, our emotions, those things as well. And then we begin to experience God's will in a way that is life-giving and joyful. We'll be resorting uh, different sources throughout this series, but Peter Scazzaro is one we've come back to now and again about emotionally healthy spirituality. Uh, Greg Boyd seeing is believing and escaping the matrix. Um, there's other sources as well. I'll list them in the insert in your newsletter and others, as I say. But this idea of being renewed, of, of moving forward, this is important. We need to explore this for a few Sundays here at Pilgrim Church because some of us, in fact, all of us have triggers and things that get us emotionally riled up for good or for ill that have been unexamined and that cause us to repeat patterns of destructive patterns in our lives that need to be broken through the grace of Jesus Christ and finding new ways of responding to those things. So let's pray and we'll dig in a little deeper. Amen. So Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this house. And God, I'm a saint and sinner in process as well. I've been made in your image and likeness, and yet this war within my own heart and flesh is very real. And I imagine if I'm that way, everyone here shares these commonalities of humanity. And Lord, we know in our lives that there are things that have happened, good and bad, that cause emotional reactions, that kick us into our animal brain, And cause us then to make decisions regarding judgments about others and ourselves that are not in line with what you have called us when we have followed you. So as we unpack that a little more in the next few Sundays, be with us this morning, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the scandalous King of all, we pray. And if you will say amen. Amen, amen. Amen. So let's talk a little more about this. Some triggers that we experience, this emotional uh, uh, rise, this emotional rise or this upsetness may not be dangerous or wrong. Food uh, can be a trigger, though. Uh, For example, food is one example of a trigger that can be a trigger for binging or anorexia or other eating disorders. But obviously, the solution begins to attaching the right thoughts to our eating versus not eating, right? There's one example. Other triggers are dangerous, and you may need to stay away from them completely. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, avoid every kind of evil. If you're struggling with drug addiction or alcoholism, you need to make commit to never entering a bar again because there's a trigger and a whole association, a constellation of things within that environment that will cause you to make decisions that take you down a path you don't want to be in terms of your relationship with those things. Or the one addicted to drugs may need to stay completely away from a neighborhood of the drug dealer who sold them whatever their drug was. If a trigger is a person, it gets a little more complex. If it's a person who deeply hurt you in the past, what is God's path for you to complete freedom? In Christianity, we say that part of the deliverance of that is forgiveness. And we should never confuse forgiveness with reconciliation. If it's extreme abuse case, and I think of the Me Too movement, there is forgiveness where you take back your power over the thing that happened to you by that other person, and you release them from your judgment. But that does not mean that your relationship with them is restored, nor necessarily should it be restored this side of eternity, because that person may still have their issues, and it's not a safe relationship. Reconciliation in some cases is appropriate, But oftentimes, if it's extreme abuse, it's not. But forgiveness we are called to do because it helps us take back our emotional state and our emotional say-so and say, I release that person from my judgment. Now, in this season or whatever, but hopefully, depending on the situation, there may be other judgments that need to happen. But you're taking back your emotional say-so. You're reclaiming your personal power that someone violated. So this idea of forgiveness may be one step in breaking the power of the trigger so when there's other things that make you think of that situation or that person, they no longer, you're no longer putting judgment onto other situations that weren't that particular one that harmed you. God, I place in my hands this person who betrayed me or hurt me. I want to learn to release this. What kind of love, again, in some cases there's love where relationships are restored. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about some of this as well. But one of the things that we want to deal with, this triggers, because if we don't deal with it, is oftentimes it leads us to this state of judgment, 
the state of experiencing emotions that we don't want with people in situations that are completely uh, different than that situation that caused the initial trigger. We don't want hatred to rule in our heart. We don't want bitterness to rule in our heart. We don't want to be there. As a pastor over the years, I've experienced projection where someone had a bad experience with some person in authority, some type of authority, and then they project it onto me, and then my mere presence becomes a trigger. Can you imagine how confusing that is for me when someone is reacting to me who doesn't actually know me at all? And maybe you've had this experience too because something about you reminds them of somebody else or some other situation. And that's a very destructive thing when we let those things happen. So let's talk a little more about this. Are you still with me? I'm just introducing it this morning. Are you? Yes? You guys are so quiet. It's like holiday quiet. Like we're beyond Canadian chill this morning. We're into like, we're in the zone before school starts or something here. Okay, all right. Uh, would you look at your neighbor this morning and say, uh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> By the way, next uh, week we'll also be uh, sharing a little bit on it's, uh, there's an annual day where we remember suicide, World Suicide Prevention Day, and that's uh, September 10th. It doesn't fall exactly on the Sunday, but uh, that's coming up as well. So let's talk a little more about triggers, okay? A little more detail here. What is a trigger specifically? A trigger is a reminder of a past trauma. This reminder can cause someone to feel overwhelmed with sadness or anxiety or panic, it can cause someone in extreme cases to have flashbacks. I had veterans in some of my churches in the States. A flashback is a vivid, often negative memory that it may appear without warning. And it can cause someone to lose track of their surroundings and even in some ways relive or remember a tragic moment. And that would be sort of the more, uh, a slightly more formal version or, or use of the word trigger. Triggers can take many forms. They can be a physical location or an anniversary of a traumatic event. We have a, I have a relative who's dealing with the death of a child, and then when that birthday comes up or special or their birthday or other people's family events, that is a natural trigger that brings back a lot of that trauma of losing that beloved person. A person can be triggered, can be triggered as well by internal processes such as stress. Sometimes these triggers in our lives are predictable. Uh, a veteran, again, may have flashbacks by watching a violent movie or playing a violent video game. Sometimes these triggers are less intuitive. Maybe someone who smelled incense and had experienced an assault against their body may have a panic attack when they smell the same incense in a store. An unwanted emotional response in a totally safe, different environment. But that's one example of triggers in sort of their, their largest sense. Some people use trigger in the context of other mental health concerns, such as substance abuse or anxiety, like we talked about. In these cases, a trigger can be a cue that prompts an increase in symptoms. A person recovering from anorexia may be triggered by photos of very thin celebrities. When the person sees these photos, they may feel the urge to starve themselves again. Again, an unwanted response, not based on your current situation. Christians also talk about triggers. So we talk about that in a more formal sense of triggers, but then in Christianity, we also talk about it regarding destructive things in our lives that we would identify as sin, what I might call sin triggers, as it were. That there's a trigger that reminds or tempts them towards a well-worn, destructive thought pattern that they had in their past. And that thought pattern may involve any number of sins, but if they go down that path, it causes a chain of emotions. And obviously, it behooves us to wrestle with that so we can react and experience new life in Christ and break the power of those triggers. This is often associated with pain or previous failures or past hurts or current broken relationships. Again, that idea... When we label someone or something a trigger, we also move emotional control back away from ourselves. And so part of naming these triggers is coming back into control of our own emotions and owning our own emotions instead of just saying, well, that's just what it is and I just have to go with it. Now let's talk one more category of triggers, sort of an informal use, which we've been weaving between the formal psychological use and sort of the informal use. The informal use is this, an event or something that, in, that initiates or incites a response within us. An event or something that causes or incites a response within us. Another idea of an informal trigger is a concept or image that upsets us. That would be the most informal use of trigger. I'm upset about something. It causes me to, to, to get riled up about it. I can't watch, for example, that violent film because blood could be one of your triggers. Again, psychology, it's an event or experience or other stimulus that initiates traumatic memory or action in a person. 
So again, why do we need to address this? Well, I hope it's becoming apparent that your spiritual life and your emotional health go together. Uh, Peter and, and I forget his wife's name again, uh, name again, I think it's Jeannie, but Scouser will talk a lot about this. But oftentimes we get stuck in our spiritual journey and we think, well, I just need to power through more scripture or I just need to worship, I need to try harder. In fact, in two weeks I'm going to talk about the problem of trying harder and what is another alternative to simply trying harder. But we can see how this ties into our spiritual journey, that there are some things that we have to deal with in our emotional state because that's where the problem lies. That's where the challenge is. And the emotions are both a blessing because they're telling us something, but depending on what we do with them, they can also be an entrapment and ensnare us. And so we, we wrestle with this. this what, is our, what is the dashboard telling us? What are the lights blinking saying to us in our emotions? So let's talk a little bit more about triggers that can, how they can trap us. Well, first off, like we already said, we become driven by fight or flight in a conflict if we don't deal with our emotional triggers. Well, I don't like what that person said, or I don't like this thing, or, or uh, some of us try to avoid it by killing all change in our lives, by saying, I want to just freeze everything in one time, in one place, and that's how I'm going to be safe. Well, you can see how that would be deadening and keep us from what organic things do, which is grow. But we get driven by fight or flight in our conflict. Again, those triggers tend to push us into our animal survival side of our brain. And it undermines our reasoning and deeper thinking and ability to love and care in the moment. And it doesn't serve us well in most cases. Uh, in personal peacemaking, Ken Sandy talks about these responses. The biblical language for fight or flight is murder or suicide in a sense. Ending of yourself, internalizing and collapsing in on yourself, or acting in a way of angry and lashing out. And that these are sort of the two extremes between the middle way of learning to walk in peace and do peacemaking uh, uh, activities towards others and with ourselves. Not necessarily literal murder, mind you, but judgment, putting yourself on the throne and always getting your identity out of judging another. If we don't deal with our emotional triggers, one way we respond to that is through this, this judgment. And saying, I'm going to set myself up as God over someone else in order to get my identity and suck it out of them by saying, well, I'm not them and I'm not this and look what they did and look how awful they are. And we do this sometimes in the church when we forget that he's the judge and we're not. And Jesus talks a lot about this as well. And James restates it too, that those who don't show mercy, none mercy will be, will be given because mercy triumphs over judgment. Uh, but this idea of not dealing with that, we enter into that judge mode, that murder mode, that executioner mode. Or we internalize it and we judge ourselves and we condemn ourselves and we are beaten down. This is sort of the biblical understanding of how fight or flight works when we experience emotional triggers that bring conflict. Is this making sense to anybody? Say amen if it is. Okay, some of you are still getting there. All right, we'll, we'll spend a little more time. The second thing why triggers can trap us, the first one is we get driven by fight or flight. If you hear something in church, for example, use this example, this is a safe example that you don't like or something somebody does, if your immediate response is fight or flight, that is an immature emotional state that you need to work through. Somebody ought to say amen because I'm speaking truth and love because I love you. If that's your response, that means that there's some discipleship that went haywire in your formation. And praise the Lord, his word is here to tell us that we are not to conform to those patterns of the world reacting, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might be able to walk forward in the vision and destiny that God has for us as individuals and as a community of faith. But if you keep reacting, fight or flight, you're not. You're still conformed to the pattern of the world. Somebody needed to hear that today. The second thing that can happen, we get trapped in fight or flight, murder or suicide emotionally. The second thing that can happen with not addressing triggers and not diving into this is identity traps. Well, this is just how it is. This is how it's meant to be. I will always be this way. This is just the way I am. These are just my emotions. My emotions are completely who I am right now. There's no time to change. It's just my personality. Others need to change all around me for me to feel safe constantly. And this is where the older generation critiques the younger generation. The other side, we had the younger generation pushing back and say, there is a middle way. <laughs> All of these responses are denying that you have a role to play in your present and future responses. When we take the role of victim permanently, we are getting our identity from judging ourselves and others again. 
And it's disempowering you, but you have been given personal power. You have been given, uh, as the scriptures say to this in him, that we have a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and a sound mind that you can take back that personal power and you have some authority that God has given you. You have to understand there's an industry and there are people who get their power by disempowering you. You have to understand that in our culture today, in the world, and certainly in Western nations, there is there's a certain group that gets their identity by creating a whole situation where they want to get power by sort of saying, we want to create these spaces, but at the end of the day, are they for healing and empowerment of the individual? We have to ask these questions. I'm going to keep going on here. Part of this, again... By taking back your personal power that the Lord has given you is starting with what is going on inside of you. When your emotional dashboard lights up, when you are triggered, what's going on? That's learning to lead yourself well. That's learning to become the best version of you, flourishing through the grace of Jesus Christ. Also as believers, we need to understand that God's grace is out there, but there's a transformational aspect of becoming more like Christ and getting our identity in Christ and resting in Christ that empowers us to react differently. So how do we begin, as we move to the end of this introduction, how do we begin to confront triggers? I think it's important that we have safe spaces in our lives. I think that's important when something triggers us, that we have a safe place to wrestle with that. For sure. And I think there's some wisdom in that, even our secular culture to embrace. But those spaces are not to be a permanent residing place. They're to be a place of healing, a place of working through what is going on inside of me. It may be necessary to do therapy or finding the Christian uh, seeing Jesus in the midst of evil and pain in the past and taking back some of that uh, authority in your life. We'll talk a little more about that in, in two weeks In terms of why trying harder isn't enough. And it won't get you there. But we have to uh, learn that we begin to confront these. By naming them and knowing them. David Beatty and Sally Colbreth give us. Five simple steps to begin. uh, Breaking the power of triggers in our lives. When we say things like I can't help it. I get angry and I just explode. That's just the way I am. I've always been short-tempered, just like my parents and grandparents. They, it's just my Italian temperament, or pick whatever ethnicity. Every, every, I think every culture's got, you know. I'm stubborn. Don't you know? That's how all Chinese or German people are. We are just stubborn. That's the way it is, you know. I'm going to get in trouble if I keep going down this path. I should just stop. <laughs> but when we make those kinds of excuses for... Well, that's just the way it is. It's the way it will always be. It's in my genetic code. It's in my DNA. It's in my people. It's in my nurture, whatever. But if you want to fully live in the freedom that God has for you, you have to take responsibility for your actions, thoughts, and emotions and say, I'm going to take back what the enemy stole from me, what someone else, the enemy stole through someone else from me. I want to take that back. So first step is this, is identify triggers in your life. That sounds really simple, but often we don't do it. We find ourselves in an emotional state and making decisions in the animal brain, fight or flight, and then we never later on step back and say, why did I react that way? Why did that thing that the pastor did drive me absolutely insane, and then I wanted to fly off the handle and crucify him, even though Jesus already paid it all. He needed to pay a little more. What's going on in me? First is to begin to ask, what are these things? Start with obvious ones. Make a list. In fact, that is your one homework piece this Sunday before you leave or after you leave, whenever. If you want to sit in here, that's fine. Uh, Is to make a list of your triggers and describe your typical response to them. What gets you worked up and why? Make that list. The second thing is to try to understand what happens before that emotional trigger happens. Does it usually happen at a certain time of day or night? Or if you're with a certain person, what is the setup? What puts you in the vulnerable position where you easily give in to that trigger and you kick into fight or flight, murder or suicide? What's going on? What's causing that? The third thing we want to say is learn to take your finger off the trigger. Make it your goal to not respond the way you always have responded before. 
When we talk about personal peacemaking, part of it is learning different patterns of reaction and, and forming ourselves in the image of Christ. Again, we'll go a little deeper with that in two weeks. But this idea that uh, if you always plan to respond, replay violence for violence, then you will probably respond with violence when you experience violence. We talk about this within the Anabaptist tradition. If your go-to is to have a gun in your, uh, your side table or your sideboard in your bedroom, then when the burglar comes in, your go-to response is going to be violence. That would be more in the U.S. than Canada, but in Canada it may be a baseball bat or whatever, you know. Then your go-to becomes that because you've trained yourself. But just like that, you can train yourself to do things differently in response. The other thing when we say take your finger off the trigger is some triggers are related to temptations and they have power because you've not made a decision to stop that activity. In your heart, you still like the identity you get from it and not willing to give it up. Well, I'll always be this or I'll always be that or I'll actually like this thing. I haven't fully come to terms with what it's doing long term in my life, whatever that may be. You can fit a lot of different things in there. Is your offensiveness... You trigger so much part of your identity. I'm a person who likes to get offended that it's suppressing better things in a future that God has for you and others in your life. I'm a person who gets my identity out of offense, out of anger, or out of uh, playing the, the, the sulky inward, whatever it may be. I get my identity out of responding this way emotionally instead of out who Jesus says I am. Maybe that thing has become so woven into your identity that there's a healing that needs to happen. And that there's something greater that God has for you, but you can't get to God's perfect and good will because you're too wrapped up in getting your identity from an emotional state of being and how people respond to you then when you're in that place, whatever it may be. There are people who try to manipulate through anger. This is a big example. If I can have that sense of offense, that's how I'm going to manipulate. There's people that try to manipulate church leadership decisions that way. I've experienced that over the years and it has to be absolutely called out, has to be dealt with. Because it is not kingdom, and the root of it is from the Father and not the Father in heaven, the other one. <laughs> and we have to be willing to identify that. If you're going to find true freedom from a trigger, you must choose to turn away from those things, that pattern of behavior. You begin by having those discussions with yourself and maybe with someone else you trust. You begin to think before you respond. And we'll talk about how that can be formed deeply within you. Last two things here, and we're almost done. The fourth is a tackle lies associated with the trigger. Bring God's truth into the picture. You need to find out what God says about the issue in your life and make that part of your thought process. Another way of seeing God's truth is to recognize that most of those lies are trying to replace something that God wants to have in your life in strength. David uses the example here of pornography. He says that instead of embracing the beauty of pornography, you make a choice to not go down that path again. What God's truth is that relates to this, that God has a plan for true intimacy and in sex. And any other expression outside of that will bring ultimately destruction into our life. If anger is your trigger, then you need to bring God's truth about anger into your thought process. If it is fear, then what does God say about fear? Learning a different narrative, a different story begins to reshape that. Fourth, attack the lies associated with the trigger. And fifth and finally, choose a new response to the trigger. And that's where we'll talk, unpack this one a lot more in uh, two weeks. How do we enter into a new response to a trigger that goes beyond simply trying harder? How are we shaped by holy imagination? How do we partner with the Holy Spirit? We need to let this new response be based on God's truth and that we can break out of those triggers. That's the good news. The safe space is there to heal, be empowered. So we need that space only to empower us to live out life in a new way. You can't change past failures, past traumas, past betrayals, other tragedies, but you can choose new responses. You can choose new responses. Things that have bound you and things that Scripture calls sin, there's ways to break out of that and find new ways of moving forward. I had one more example, but because of time, I'll spare you that because we want to get to communion here. So your takeout this morning is super simple. The one thing I want you to do, your one homework piece, is to begin to identify your triggers. Can you do that before this day is out? Get a piece of paper, write it out, type it out, whatever. 
What is it that causes you to respond emotionally in ways and then make decisions that you don't like or you feel are not what Jesus would have for you? You say, that's simple homework. It is. But some of us have never done it. There may be things right now that are controlling you when they happen or environments, a relationship, a situation, and you need to ask, why, what is this trigger and why do I think it's happening? And then in two weeks, we want to talk about a different way of approaching it beyond just sort of mentally powering our way through it because that's not enough. There's something deeper that can be happen. It can happen in terms of how transformation happens. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test what the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God is. Let's pray. And we're going to prepare for communion today as we end this service. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. And as we bounce between talking about triggers and whether they're emotional upsetness or related to deeper trauma, I pray that this would be a safe place to wrestle with deep ideas and freedom. And that we understand that that safeness isn't about running from reality, but running to reality and learning new ways of dealing with these things. And that your word speaks to this, that your word has much to say about how we are transformed deeply from within instead of simply trying to try harder from the outside inward. God, thank you that you desire freedom for people, that each person here, man, woman, and child, you have a greater desire for them and a vision for how their life can look fully alive and flourishing in you. So do that work in this house. Give us the strength to begin to name and identify what's causing fight or flight, murder or suicide. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.